This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. To the highway, in a brand new day, gotta let it go. Fast to freedom, Welcome back to Open the Voice Gate for May 11th, 2021. We are members of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on the Voices of Wrestling feed, or you can find us our own dedicated podcast feed on all podcast platforms and applications. You can follow us on Twitter at Open Voice Gate. If you'd like to donate to the show, just click, click the link in the show notes. It'll take you to our redcircle.com landing page. You click the red box that says Sponsor This Podcast, and you can set up a one-time or recurring donation no obligation whatsoever, but we would like to thank all of our previous donors. I am one of your hosts. It's your old pal, Aaron Mike Spears. Joined alongside, as always, my friend and co-host, Case Lowe. And Case, we did not know how this all was going to shake up, but it is King of Gate season, baby. And boy, do we have a heavy next two weeks, and then we get a little bit of time off, and then it's going to get heavier again. But uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We've got a heavy two weeks of King of Gate and then, like you said, we're supposed to get a little bit of a break and then for it to pick up again. I don't see this June Cork and Hall show happening given the current state of events in Japan. So we'll see. But we know at the very least we have a triple shot this upcoming weekend, a triple shot the following weekend. And we're going to be your central hub for everything King of Gate this podcast. Uh, a lot of exciting stuff, a lot of things out in the open, a lot of things unknown at this point. It is very good to be back in King of Gate season. It is, it is. So, for those who missed the news, they are basically every show that was supposed to happen last week. They're shoving them all, all the the block matches onto a single empty arena show on Friday. We'll see how that goes, but there'll be shows 15th and the 16th, and then the triple shot in Hokkaido, and then nothing will make tape until the June Cork, and that we will we'll deal with it when it comes to it. You know, what I mean it best laid plans and all of that but that's not all we're going to be talking about this week we're going to be of course breaking down what's coming up this weekend we're going to give our block predictions and we were also we, we have a we have a series of matches we're going to talk about tonight and all the links to these matches are going to be in the link description and or in the show description but one match is a match we were talking about for a little bit and we were able to find it and the other one we talked about this a little bit on Pro Wrestling Paradise of Alan Farrell this weekend, but we are starting a Yoshino retrospective series that's going to run up until his retirement, and we're kind of doing like an episode zero tonight, so we've got a lot of stuff that we're going to be talking about today, guys. Yeah, for some reason you missed it, Mike and I did seven hours of audio this weekend with Alan Farrell over on the Pro Wrestling Torch. We've been talking about this project on the show, on our show, on and off for about six months now, we have been participating in a Greatest Wrestler Ever project, a five-year refresh of the poll that Pro Wrestling only did in 2016 at the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, Alan Forel, who is a friend of the show, he's been on the show before, uh, said, hey, let's give this another shot. I was very eager to participate, and we got Mike to submit his first ballot of this kind. Uh, we did... A few hours of audio a few months ago on specifically Dragon Gate, guys. I can't recommend that show enough. That got tremendous feedback from everybody that listened, and we very much appreciate that. And then this past weekend, we wrapped everything up on The Torch. I know as of this recording, part one is out, where we discuss our top ten wrestlers. And then throughout this week, we will have parts two 
and three dropping. And then as for this Yoshino project, it will not be a weekly occurrence like the Dragon Gate USA Rewind and Rewatch series is. This one's going to be a little bit more free-flowing on weeks where we don't have a ton to cover or on some weeks where we don't have anything to cover. Uh, we are going to hit the Masada Yoshino archives and we're going to do what we can to make sure these matches uh, are accessible as possible for you guys to watch along with us. The matches we're discussing tonight are on the Drangi Network, so if you're a subscriber, boom, there you go. Uh, in future weeks, we might venture out of the limited archive that the network has, and if we do, we will make sure that a link is in the description for where and how to watch. Absolutely, and we'll get more into that series when we get to it. But Case, it is King of Gate. It is time to determine... 2021's number one Dragon Gate fighter, as they call it, which I always love. And uh, the the big changes from what we've talked about before, Hip Hop Kakuda has been pulled out of the C block due to the injury he suffered at Dead or Alive. No real indication on how long he is going to be out. I know that the day after Jay tweeted that he seemed like that he was fine, but so it might be a precautionary thing. I mean, it's a lot of matches that over a short period of time, they might not want to be having someone with a bum wing on uh he is replaced by Hio for nc block so should we pre should we talk about the blocks first before we get into previewing this week's shows yeah i could run down the blocks real quick if you'd like me to there's three blocks and 18 participants block a is diamante bb hulk kota minora naruki doi ben k and takashi yoshida Block B is S, B, Kento, Jason Lee, Susumi Yokosuka, Dragon Kid, KZ, and Eita. And Block C is UT, Yamato, Kaisuke Akuda, our Open the Dream Gate champion, Shun Skywalker, Kaito Ishida, and Hyo replacing the injured Hip Hop Kakuda. So, interesting off the bat, we're back to the traditional league format, but we're doing three blocks instead of four. A lot of omissions here, I, I think it's fair to say. M more interestingly to me, I mean, Susumu, DK, and Doi are the only uh, Torimon students that we have. Are the rest of it's all Trueborn or people who came aboard uh, in recent years. So I thought that was all kind of interesting just looking at the blocks or the 18 wrestlers we have here. Uh, what were your initial takeaways of the participants? Yeah, I, I may have mentioned this on the show a few weeks ago when we first got these lineups or these blocks announced, but the lineup this year shows just how deep this roster has become in such a short amount of time. Because even you look at your contemporary guys on the roster, there's no Shimizu, there's no Dragon Daya, there's no Kai, there's no Cosmo Sakamoto. Uh, even a guy like Kagatora is absent from the lineup, and then you look at your legends, like a Masaki Mochizuki, a Ryo Saito, uh, Masato Yoshino, Don Fuji. Those guys are not there. And uh, while this will sound like a put-down, some of your lesser wrestlers would, I, would maybe refer to as King of Gate dead weight just because you know they're not going to go far. Your Yosuke Santa Maria's and your Punch Tamanaga's, those people are also absent this year. So it's a lineup full of heavy hitters and people that, you know, I, I, there's obviously a few favorites and there's a few people listed that we know are not going to win. But the people that are not going to do well in points will likely exceed in match quality. So there's a lot of things to like within this lineup. Yeah, I mean, you, when you have someone like Jason Lee in here, for example, I... I think it's entirely be reasonable to say that he's not winning King of Gate and probably not winning his block, but you put him up against other five guys in his block, and I mean, each and every single one of those matches, especially the ones make tapes, th those are all heavy-hitting matches. So not any chaff here. Uh, Kota Minora getting put in A block, I think is a big thing, cause considering who is all in A block. And then, you know, Block C, I mean, you have uh, you have the champion, you have the ace, you have the Brave Gate champion, you have the former Brave Gate champion, you, and then you have UT and Hyo. That's a spicy one as well. I really like the composition of the blocks, and with the format this year, it's less important than ever to win your block. Yeah, that's kind of a nice wrinkle. I, I, I don't... I, I'm always mixed on how I feel about the Battle Royal to decide that fourth semifinalist, but I think this year specifically, again... A block like Block C, 
there's a lot of different possibilities there. You've got Yamada, who's an obvious favorite. You've got Kaisuke Akuda, who's a Brave Gate champion. Shun Skywalker, who's the Dream Gate champion. And Kaito Ishida, who at this point is a burgeoning, credible main eventer. And those are all people that could come out of the block or win the Battle Royal. And I, and I would assume, I guess this could be my first prediction, that the Battle Royal winner, Battle Royal winner will come out of that C block because there's just too many names there and that stiff competition for everybody involved. And then again, you have UT, who is obviously going to crush it, and Hyo, who, uh, you know, knows his role and is very capable of putting on a, a great match when the duty calls for it. So there's a lot to like here. I, I we, we really haven't discussed predictions in terms of who we think is going to win. Uh, I think you have a favorite that I'm aware of. Uh, I have a take that I'm going to lay on you at some point that I've alluded to in the past, but there's a lot to like here. I think assuming the empty arena atmosphere is healthy, if it's not dire, I think the matches we get in the empty arena settings are going to be a lot of fun. And I like the Fukuoka lineups that we have coming up this weekend. So I'm very looking for, very much looking forward to this. Yeah, so we're, we're going to have 15 matches this weekend. And we'll get a really good indication of where the booking is going forward by Sunday. And yeah, you have the people here who are going to play their role. I mean, BB Hulk and Yoshida, they're there to play their roles. Uh jason as i talked about before and Hio. but after that i think like those are really i think i would say the five people i would take out of consideration here and then the other 13 people you could probably you can make an argument it might not be a strong argument but you can make an argument for basically any of the other 13 people maybe not men and or but possibly if they decided to rocket pack the kid well i you know I have seen a lot of predictions uh, on King of Gate on Twitter over the past week, and Kota Minora is a popular pick to come out of the A block. He might not be the favorite. I think I would throw that onto Ben K or Doi, but there are people, both Western fans and Native fans, that are ready for Coach Minora to take the A block. So I, I don't think it's going to happen, but quite honestly, if it does, it would not surprise me. Yeah, so I think that those three, when we talk about the A block, those are your most likely people to move on to the knockout stage and Naruki Doi, Benkei, and Kota Minora. Before we move on, just in case no one is someone has dropping off this episode and they didn't listen to previous ones, the format is that they'll be doing head to head in each block. They'll do a single round robin, so everyone will have five matches. Standard scoring a rubric, two points for a win, one point for a time limit draw, zero for any loss, no contest, or double count out. And then the three block winners, and then someone on the 30th, I think that's in Hiroshima, will be in a second chance battle royal. Last year, not everyone was in the battle royal. They did a lottery for it. But for this year, I could see them trying to do a full battle royal there. But so the three block winners and the winner of the battle royal will go on to the show that is on paper June 3rd in Tokyo. And they'll be doing the semifinals and the finals at the same night. This weekend, we are getting uh, the empty arena matches that were, or I guess they're now empty arena matches, the matches that were originally set for the May 7th Cork and Hall show, the May 8th Shizuoka show, which was not a televised event originally, and the May 9th Kobe Sambo Hall show. Those matches hitting the network on Friday, they should be up there by the time you wake up on Friday morning. It will be Naruki Doi versus Ben K in a Final Gate 2019 rematch, Dragon Kid versus SB Kento in one of their many rematches at this point, and Yamato versus Shun Skywalker. Those are the matches we were supposed to get in Cork and Hall. The May 8th show that we're now getting in the empty arena setting, Jason Lee versus Ata. BB Hulk versus Takashi Yoshida and a rematch from Dead or Alive, Kaisuke Akuda versus UT. And then the last three matches, Kota Minora versus Diamante, KZ versus Susumi Yokosuka, and Hyo versus Kaito Ishida. From that little cluster there, Mike, what is the match that you are most looking forward to? I think the one that I'm most looking forward to that's not a a rematch is KZ versus Susumi Yokosuka because you talked... <laughs> You, you talked, oh, was that yours? You stole my take, Mike. It's okay. It's <laughs> well, okay. Well, well, I'm going to say what my belief was on this, and it's probably going to be a different take than yours when I get around to it. Uh, the things that I noticed, at least from Native fans, KZ is a heavy favorite for this tournament when I did not necessarily see it, at least from the Native side. So th this is a match that, given that block, he's going to probably need that win because... I mean, I think we could assume that looking at Dragon Kid and Jason Lee, those two people, 
DK could get out of the block, but I don't think that's necessarily going to happen. And Jason Lee is going to have awesome matches. Uh, but for KZ, I think he has to start off on a big foot uh, on the right foot in this B block, especially considering that J that Ata should have a win over Jason that day. And then what's the other B block match? And then Dragon King SB Kanto, that could go any way possible. So I think that that match is really important to see who's going to be coming out of the empty arena and going into the weekend in Fukuoka at the head of the B block. Let me ask you this. It kind of jumps ahead a little bit, but in terms of Ata, who's in that B block, the winner last year went on to win the Dream Gate out of his performance at King of Gate. I've been very critical of him in the past, and I don't even mean this as a dig necessarily, but it might it doesn't seem like he's coming into this tournament with a lot of momentum. Like to me, Ata is not the favorite in his block. I think uh uh KZ obviously has a better chance. I think Dragon Kid with the way he's positioned, like Dragon Kid feels hotter than Ata right now. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think that's been a thing that they've made pretty clear. And I think this is one of those things that again, if you're someone entering the promotion uh, be sure to watch the commentary on the big shows and and uh, the Tokyo shows with Jay doing commentary because he laid out a, the theory that he's okay with with Ata taking a step back and letting the younger guys make a run for it. Now that that is a storyline that's played out a couple times in Dragon System history, but with Ata with Ata this time, this isn't like uh, Shingo who was just an omnipresent figure that you know let uh the millennials kind of run the heel unit and decided daddy needed to fix things up here this is something where it you know it feels like it's leading towards something here so i mean i don't know if i could say that ada has any like momentum in it whatsoever and i think that dragon kid is dragon kid is someone that could just as easily go zero and five or win the damn thing well like he has that much of uh he, he has like that wide of a range of how I, of expectations i feel like well, we're going to get more Dragon Kid matches this week. He doesn't just have the SB Kento match, but in Fukuoka on May 15th, he will wrestle KZ in a match that I am once again very much looking forward to. Also on that show, Takashi Yoshida versus Diamante and Yamato versus Kaisuke Akuda. The following day, once again in Fukuoka, they are doing a double header, or I, I, I'm sorry, a double shot instead of a double header this weekend, which is very nice. Uh, we're going to get Naruki Doi versus Coach Minora. Shun Skywalker versus Kaito Ishida in a Champion Gate rematch, and Dragon Kid versus Ata in what will be the rubber match, because right now they are 3-3 three and three all time against each other in singles matches. This is a Game 7 of sorts for Dragon Kid and Ata. So, two things. One, is this the first time that they've faced each other since Final Gate 2019? I believe so, but I can run a or double check of that. Apology. Yeah, yeah, I believe so. 2018. Yeah, and that reminds me of something so... Case, I know you do not uh, consume the esports. You you like your sports to be physical and up in front of you. This is but, correct. But right now, League of Legends is having what they call their midseason invitational. It's kind of like their I don't want to call it like an all star game, but it is like a major international tournament. And because one of the teams couldn't travel, they picked the best teams from each league across the world. Vietnam is now allowing their citizens to leave the country, so Vietnam got pulled out. And they it, it, it was something where like usually it's a double round robin everyone plays everyone in their group twice but now there was one group that was one short and they unintentionally had it so it was a quadruple round robin and then they needed a tiebreaker for between two teams to see who would advance here so it has some really big rubber match vibes uh there was another match on the empty arenas that i found was pretty interesting case that i didn't want to make sure we didn't gloss over and i just copied things from facebook it is listed as the main event of the empty arena show in the c block Yamato versus Shun Skywalker. Yes. That's very interesting to me. Well, I, it feels like a match that is going to certainly have some impact on the summer that we see in Dragon Gate now. To some people, that could mean that Yamato is going to win, and however he finishes in King of Gate is irrelevant. He could win the tournament, he could be a semifinalist, he could be a finalist, but Yamato will have that win over Shun Skywalker and can use that to leverage himself into a Dream Gate opportunity in the future. I think that's a very realistic possibility. In fact, I would put money on Yamato winning that match. I think he is the favorite there. I think that is the the safe pick. Would you see any possibility of Shun Skywalker, the current Dreamgate champion, someone who, outside of Ben K, hasn't really had a natural feud at this mm -hmm. point? He's just kind of been running through heel challengers. 
is there any way that the current Dreamgate champion knocks off one of the obvious potential challengers down the line in this match? Well, I mean, it's also uh, any loss that Shun Skywalker takes is his first direct fall since returning from Mexico. So, and they've made a big thing, like Shun Skywalker tweeted about that he wants to go, like Binke, undefeated through King of Gate. He wants to win King of Gate's champion. So, I, I, I can see Yamato winning this, and then... And, and then neither of them advancing on, but then Yamada going, I beat you in King of Gate. I won a title shot. That was your first loss you've had. You yeah, I, I think that's a very safe bet. I know Shun wants to go undefeated like Ben K, but I don't see that happening. Uh, he's he's he, in that loaded block, and yeah, I, I, I just I don't see that. I think he's going to take the loss to Yamato here. Yeah, I, I think that out of anything on this MT Arena show, I think that's the one you chalk up as like, that's the one I think I would put my money on happening because looking at the rest of the matches on that, I mean, SPK could just as easily be on a losing streak or just easily get comeuppance. Uh, Ishida versus Hio, high jinx right there. I mean, I'm not going to make a prediction on that. Doi and Ben K could go either way. It could be either Doi kind of cementing himself as like the chief old man in the promotion, or it could be Ben K finally starting something. UT could get his win back. Yoshida and Hulk, who knows? And then really, like, Minodora and Diamante, I think that that's something where Diamante is so protected that he might win that match, but then Minodora cleans up outside of that. And then the two matches we've talked about before, Keizin and Susumu and Yamato and Shun, it's just Yamato and Shun just seems like the most obvious result there to me. Am I off base in saying that? No, I, I think that is the, the direction that things are going. And it's obviously, you know, one of my big critiques of Ada's Dreamgate run was that he was a guy that was constantly not positioned in main events. I would assume that this is going on last on this empty arena show, whatever that means, but at least the the agency of it being a main event is important. And I think the KZ Susumu and the Yamato shoot matches are the most important matches we're going to see on those empty arena shows. Mike... Would you like to make some predictions? Would you like to sort of lay out who you think your block champions are going to be, who your battle royal winner is going to be, and who the ultimate winner of King of Gate is? Okay. So, again, saying it's harder to kind of pick who can win this because of the uh, the battle royal and, and with all that. I think that either Shun or Yamato is getting out of C block with possibly the other one winning the Battle Royal. I agree with you. I think the Battle Royal winner is coming out of the C block. B block, KZ. Block A, Doi or Ben K? I, I'm going to go Doi. So then I think it's going to be Doi, KZ, Shun, and Yamato. I'm kind of feeling like KZ wins this year. I, I'm I'm kind of feeling that. And you just did a side with me. I, I wanted I to argue with you on this show, and you scooped me on the Doi thing. I thought we were going to have an argument about Doi because I had this whole reason why Doi was coming out of the A block. And then Mike has been banging this drum for months now, banging this drum that it's Yamato versus Shun at Kobe World. Let's... Oh, I still think it's that. I still uh, think it's that. And now... I, I, I... Now Mike Spears snipes my take and he says KZ <laughs> is winning King of Gate and I I am just I am just right. devastated. Let let me go Plan B. My Plan B is Yamato wins and then we don't have another uh, defense up into Kobe World. Which I mean the fact that they don't have they're only gonna have one cork and until then you're gonna have to squeeze in a place for the defense there. So Shunin Yamato. I mean I can go with Yamato winning. Like I'm really fifty fifty about it. like this isn't like last year where it was like oh, okay like there's a lot of stuff there that felt somewhat obvious especially with a knockout tournament. But this year, there's a lot of ways to go for us. I mean, it's not as like obvious as like, oh, Yoshino is going to win that one that year. And then Benke, as soon as Benke was turned on, we're like, oh, yeah, Benke is winning at Kobe World. He's going to King of Gate. Like, this is a hard one to pick this year. And specifically because of the strength of the A block and the C block, because I think we both have the same ideology that we're going to get two semifinalists out of the C block. But then you look at the top of the field and again, I think Minora's a big threat, and I, I don't think you can sell Minora short. He is a threat to win that block, but then you also have Doi and you have Ben K. It, it creates a lot of commotion, because I really only think we're going to get one guy coming out of that block. So, I really like the lineups this year. I really like it's laid out. 
even it, it, it's tough to say, but even Ata is a threat to win the B block. So now you're looking at a situation where maybe KZ, Ata, and Dragon Kid could all be semi finalists. It obviously wouldn't surprise any of us if SB Kento went that far, although I think him having only one televised match is enough for us to put that in the rear view. And Susumu's always a threat. So. There's a lot to like here. Uh, my predictions are the same as you. Doi, KZ, Shun. I think Shun's going to win the block, and I think Yamato's going to win the Battle Royal. The thing with Doi is that because he's not going to have a unit until after Yoshino retires, he has to be doing something. And King of Gate can be that something. It could be singles matches for him where he doesn't have to be in random six man with Saito and Fuji. He can just be by himself in these in these hype matches. And I think uh, I think Shun and Doi and KZ and Yamato is just a good pairing that feels like the core of Dragon Gate right now. Kind of a final run for Doi. Uh, KZ has a win over him at Dangerous Gate last year. Shun, I, I don't think he and Doi have ever had a singles match, but Shun can always gain something by beating Doi in a semifinals. And then you have the the obvious tie-ins of Yamato and Doi the greatest tag team champions of all time, numerous singles matches between the two. That is a cluster that just works. And I, I, I just, I like the pairing of those there. And I agree. I think KZ is beating Yamato or beating somebody, uh, preferably Yamato to win King of Gate this year. In terms of what you brought up just a second ago about there are perhaps being one defense in between uh, the finals of King of Gate, which as of now is slated for June 3rd in Corican Hall and Kobe World, which is at the end of July, you have to look at that schedule and realize that the June schedule they're running is a weird schedule. As of right now, and this is assuming that none of these shows get canceled, you have the June 3rd show, Cork and Hall, you have June 5th, Kobe Sambo Hall, and then they do not make TV again until June 26th for a second Sambo Hall show. So there's no Fukuoka there's no Osaka number two. There's no secondary building that you can really run a Dreamgate defense in. I think the only opportunity to do it, and I don't see them doing this, although it would be awesome, is if they were going to do a Dreamgate match at the July 9th Cork and Hall show with the winner of that headline in Kobe World. Now, that would go against 21 years of booking patterns we've seen from Dreamgate. I don't see that happening, but it would be exciting if it did. Hey, I mean, what a what a birthday present for Mama Spears to have a Cork and Main Event Dreamgate match twenty two days before Kobe World Pro Wrestling Festival. It's what, what she's always it's, it's what she's always wanted. I, I I mean, she only knows five professional wrestlers, so and hit me with those be. five. So it is uh, John Cena. Actually, it's six. I apologize. It's six. It's John Cena, the Bella Twins, Daniel Bryan, uh, Bobo Brazil, and Big Cat Ernie Lad. Explain the Bobo and Ernie Cat tie-ins for me. I guess my my mom's from Southern Ohio. I don't know what territory that was. I guess that was who was ever on the TV in the territory. Hmm. I don't. I don't know either. I. I this is uh, the the rare time that this show needs a Chris Zellner appearance so he can explain that to us. But I don't. It, I don't know who had Southern Ohio. Is it Andy? Was it the uh, Bruiser out of Indianapolis? Maybe ran Ohio. Uh, I, I don't. Dick the Bruiser in the WWE. I think they were pretty exclusive to Indiana and then occasionally Chicago. At least that's my okay. understanding of the territory. I mean, I know Crockett had Ohio pretty soon into his national expansion, but I would think Bobo and Ernie Ladd would predate that a little bit. And they weren't really Crockett guys. No, no, I'm looking right now. I don't know when this map was made and what time frame it's supposed to be taking a place of, but Ohio is trisected. It is part Detroit, which makes sense. You know, I mean, Detroit. And then, as you said, part Crockett from uh, Crockett Promotions. And then uh, part the National Wrestling Federation, Buffalo and Cleveland, which is not a territory you ever hear about whatsoever. God, I... I bet the that that just sounds awful. That that sounds horrible. I'm glad we don't have a ton of tape running around of the NWF because I guarantee those matches are all terrible. Well, well, like I'm looking at the map here, case, and it's kind of like the old MLB blackout map because I like how things like kind of cross over and such. And the the, the this uh, National Wrestling Federation territory. And I would like to apologize to Brandon Thurston for running down ter- for running down Buffalo. It's far western Pennsylvania basically the buffalo area 
and then northeast Ohio. Like, that can't have been a territory that was making any money. No, that that sounds terrible. Uh, that's I, I mean, that's the thing. When Crockett started expanding, it became a pretty easy place for him to move into because he knew there were wrestling fans there, but there was no hot market because, again, Dick the Bruiser wasn't running there. He was he was Indiana and he was Chicago. Um, so Ohio became Crockett country pretty quick. My mom is a big Young Bucks fan, a big Kevin Steen fan, and... Uh, I, those are those are the people she knows because those were kind of the stars at the Ring of Honor shows we would go to, and I just remember trying to explain to her at one point that Kevin Steen was now on WWE TV and he beat John Cena in a singles match. I guess she knows John Cena too, and she was like, "No, that's the fat guy from the Ring of Honor shows. That didn't happen." I was like, "No, I swear. It's like it's really cool that he did that." Um, my grandma used to before she passed away uh, go on tirades about dick the bruiser and how he was such a terrible person uh and how he was you know no good for this city uh because he was you know often a heel in the wwa and the thing that i like was that uh of people that age they'd be like oh yeah we saw dick the bruiser uh hanging out in his garage all the time and his garage doubled as the wwa office so he was just getting work done and people would see him (laughs) booking the territory as they walked by that's so tight i love that uh so so, so i did look at the i i'm looking right now at stuff apparently other than of course we've already talked about it uh columbus had the midwest wrestling association from 1948 to the mid 60s that would have set before my mom when my mom was growing up and that was ohio and kentucky but the thing is that was linked into partially the wwa partially crockett partially and this is a name that you know, you're not going to hear a whole, a whole lot. Orville Brown. Yeah, that, I, I did not we, realize we the get... hellhole that Ohio wrestling was. Yeah, we, we need to get uh, 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 Chris Elner and we need to get Carl Stern to kind of help explain uh, to us the situation about Ohio wrestling. But uh, anyways. By the way, no, just... I'm sorry, real quick. Did you see the post? Uh, Chad Campbell put it on his Twitter at. Uh, where big boys play WCW or something like that. Uh, the old message board post that Carl Stern had in like 2001, running down all of the wrestlers that he didn't know about. Was this okay? So, so that was Carl Stern's post. I think so. Cause I, well, let me make sure I've got this right. Maybe. Uh, yeah. It oh, was it Carl is, Stern. Yes. Yeah. Uh, at big boys play WCW, Chad Campbell's Twitter account, the DVD VR 500 where, in November of 2001, Carl Stern says, I cover pro wrestling, so let's see about all these guys I, I've never heard of. Uh, and he complains that Liger is number one. He doesn't know 54 Masaki Mochizuki. He doesn't know 62 Genki Horiguchi, 112 Big Fuji, uh, 122 Vinny Massaro, which I love that Vinny Massaro is on this list. 124, Good for him. Yeah, right? 124 Susumu Mochizuki, 128 Yasushi Kanda. Uh, Makoto, the, the future Kness, is on this list as well down the line. That post was very funny to me. I'm glad Chad shared that. I'm looking at this right now. There is like uh, Doug Williams, uh, the person who who now wrestles Kuga, Averno, Shibata, Xavier, the uh, Spanish uh, assault team, uh, Monster Mac, Yun Kasai, Black Buffalo, and then you can see at the very bottom at 194, Chris Hero. <laughs> Great post. Okay, Th- that actually, that actually kind of like makes my day now i have some context there i i after we pretty much recorded with alan and i did something with my brother drew sunday morning i've been mostly offline so like, like catching up with these things it, this is kind of like this the new version of Rembert explains but it's going to be case explaining things that mike missed on twitter this is a good segment uh what you may have missed had you not been deeply clued in on the world of okinawa pro wrestling was on May 4th, the day before Dead or Alive, Yamato versus Garukin Mask in Ryuku Dragon Pro. Mike Spears, let's talk about this match for a second. Yeah, so this was for Garukin Mask's 20th anniversary. Of course, you, Casey, you, you know, but but our, and our listeners know, but Garukin Mask, the dawn of Okinawa wrestling, just the absolute boss. He's the one who kind of picked up the banner after... Uh, uh, Super Delphin stopped running Okinawa Pro, and then 
became a Ryukyu dragon. He had there's a, a Ryukyu dragon and Dragon Gate are aligned. And that weird June that Case was talking about, one of the reasons why it is weird is that Dragon's doing their semi-annual trip to Okinawa. And with their alliance, maybe something that makes tape, that'd be so cool if we got some of that. But this was the night before uh, Dead or Alive. Uh, Yamato left his entrance his entrance robe either on the plane or on the train coming out of Okinawa or trying to make it to Aichi. So the, the, the kind of the background there. And yeah, this match just off the top... Uh, Gurken Mask is one of those like hidden secrets that whenever he pops up, and I feel like I've said this a ton of times, case. Whenever Gurken Mask pops up, I am delighted this guy owns. Yeah, I mean, he's a pretty old guy now for wrestling standards, and I had never heard of him until he did the 2016 J Cup. He wrestled Pro Wrestling Noah's Kano in the first round. And if you're thinking, oh, it's Yamato versus Gurken Mask, it's just one of these fun dream matches, you would be incorrect. Mike, the lore of Garukin Mask. Let me tell you about this lore for a second. He put on his blog, which we'll throw a link in the description to this post so you can read it. But he said he's wanted a singles match with Yamato ever since the Super J Cup, where he was so excited it was the first J Cup in seven years at that point. He's like, great. J Cup is obviously going to be on the cover of Weekly Piero. Maybe my face will be on the cover of this magazine. And instead, that was the same week as Dragon Gate Kobe World 2016, and Yamato ended up on the cover of Weekly Puro that week, and Garuka Mask was pissed! He couldn't believe it, that Yamato stole his cover, so you had a lot of lore built into this match, if you will. And then they went out there, and this tiny, like, world of sport-sized ring, it looked like it was about 14 by 14, in front of a very small, intimate audience, and I thought they had a legitimately great match. Yeah, I went four and a quarter on this. I loved it. Wow, like, okay, this so you're is... higher than I was. I was afraid when I sent you this that Mike no. was going to be like, yeah, it was fine. Like, I don't know what the big deal is because I went four stars flat. And, and just so you guys know, we'll put a link in the description of this match. Uh, it's going to be uploaded to a YouTube channel, put as unlisted because... I could not figure out how to find this match. Uh, thank you to one of our Twitter followers who luckily knows how twit casting works and pulled it for me so I could watch it and then I downloaded it and put it on YouTube for you guys. So that'll be uh, in the link to this episode or the description to this episode will be the link to the video. But I'm I'm delighted that you liked it even more than I did. Yeah, so the, the thing that got me about this match was two things. They, they used the smaller ring to their advantage. Like, like they weren't going sprint style here. This was very cerebral. This was like, I mean... The, the the opening section had well worked Roman knuckle locks like they were using that as like a central focus and then it was a lot of like the old school Yamato that we've talked about in the Dragon Gate USA series about when Yamato in 2009 through 2012 just had a lot more I, I guess for lack of better terms when he was really still under the battleship gimmick he when it was like playing rudo there he was really just very uh he had a lot of machinations like like he case you know i popped when he did his old hide under the ring get out on the other side and clock the guy trick like things like that just like really got me and it's just Gurk and mass had like a tremendous baby face presence in this match uh they, they worked in the dojim sleeper where uh yamato kept on getting onto gurken's ma- masks back and Gurken Mask being an older guy was like really like flailing and then realized oh I need to clamp the turnbuckle and get him off that way and it just was like Gurken Mask like firing up not letting Yamato the guy who took his cover like get one over on him and just was like a very kind of just well worked 20 minute match you guys see shades of Yamato we don't get to see that often and Gurken Mask rocks like he is someone that whenever he pops up on shows, I usually chuckle like, hell yeah, Gurk and Mask. But he's legitimately a very good wrestler. And I had a, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, this was one of those matches that kind of reminds you just how good Yamato can be. And I, at times, have become one of his harshest critics because I really thought we saw a two or three year stretch there in kind of 2017 through some way through 2019 where he was lazy. And it seemed like he was past his prime, and he was checked out. Uh, We saw a lot of slow Yamato grappling matches that didn't do a ton for me. 
But this was vintage Yamato, and using the small ring to their advantage, this was a pretty grounded match, and it maintained a pretty slow pace throughout. It was worked on the mat, it was grappling-centric, and I thought it was really, really interesting. This is the type of match that uh, wasn't a similar grappling style because they leaned so much into the Yave stuff in Super Shisa and UT from a few years ago, that prime zone match that, that Mike Spears lost his mind about, and rightfully so, it was a very good match. But the UT versus Shisa match could not happen on a regular Dragon Gate show. It just wouldn't be given time to breathe. The environment wouldn't be right for it. It would just, it, it would still be good, but it would be different. And this was kind of the same thing here. This is a match that if it happened in a Kobe Sambo Hall environment or even a Dragon Gate show in Okinawa, it would feel a little bit different. But they worked this perfectly to the environment they were in. Uh, the fan front row wearing the Garukin mask mask was just a sight to behold. Just what a super fan. I mean, can you imagine Stan culture for Garukin mask? That is what I'm all about. And he and Yamato went out there. They had this very compelling, almost a 25-minute match, I think. Like, this was given time to breathe. There were stages of this match. Garukin Mask is a pro, and he held up his end of the bargain with Yamato. This is one of those matches that was just different than what you see. Maybe you need a palate cleanser after the triple shot this weekend, uh, because you're going to see a lot of the Dragon Gate style on display. This was something totally different that I think many listeners of this podcast would enjoy. Also, Gurken Mask theme rocks, because it keeps on going Gurken, Gurken, and I just found myself bopping along as I watched it. Like, this is, it, it, it shows in a lot of ways, like, how, like, one, how, like, Gurken Mask is like, one of those kept secrets, but two, Yamato, like, when he's given stuff, and maybe it's something that he was like, okay, this is something where I could kind of, you know, let my hair down a little bit and just kind of have fun. And I have to say, this is probably my favorite Yamato singles match since, uh, geez, the match he lost the belt to Mochizuki, I think. Yeah, that's a that's a good question as to when was the last time that I enjoyed a Yamato singles match as much as this. Now, I also just think there was a part of it that was like, wow, this is such a departure from what we normally see that this was fun, but Yamato's become a very fun tag worker, but it's been a long time since we've really seen a Yamato singles match to deliver to such a high degree. I mean, I, I like this probably as much as the Ben K title defense from Dangerous Gate 2019. That was probably the last okay. Yamato singles match that I really liked, but even that was a totally different style of match than this was. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say I really like that Mochizuki match, but I'm also, but it's also Mochizuki. I, I would probably put this one in between those two, in my opinion. Yeah, that's fair. This was this was one of those deals, you know, I, I said this in the Voice of Wrestling Slack a few weeks ago, because people were talking about Gleet and I think some Big Japan at some point, and just the the, the bottom level of relevant wrestling companies in Japan right now. And it annoys me to some extent that for all of the startups that you see and for all of the offshoots and for all of the produce shows, no one is really filling that Michinoku Pro, Osaka Pro type void of having that almost second tier Lucharesu or just sort of fast paced junior style promotion because Garukin Mask is someone that I, I think if there was any sort of relevancy to Michinoku Pro at this point, he's a guy that would work if he could work that promotion and make tape often, I think more people would get a kick out of this guy. But unless you are familiar with the functionality of twit casting, which I am not a rocket scientist, so I am not. He's making tape if you're lucky once or twice a year doing like an eight man tag on a on a big show for a bigger company. Yeah, and the Gherkin, uh, not the Gherkin Pro, the uh, Riku Dragon Pro roster is not a bad roster looking at it. You have the former Mill Mongoose, you have Hibiscus Me, uh, you get a lot of Minora Fujita, so your mileage might vary on that. And then you have Riku Dog Dingo, who has been around the wrestling scene forever. And was so, like, there's a lot of people here on like the show. And I think the, the thing that's really cool, and I, I really like this part in Dragon Gate Strategy, is like, Partnering up with Riku Dragon and partnering up with Kyushu Pro, these are very city centric and like their overall area centric promotions. I think that's like really neat. Like I find those like immensely more interesting than whatever is happening in like Freedoms or 
I'm trying to think of another uh, really kind of small, or I, I, I guess, what was that promotion that was uh, that that was like that mini promotion that had a lot of strong heart stuff? It was like J something or other? Oh, J Stage. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me of like how J Stage was like doing something completely different in a way. I like the fact that like their version of doing something different is doing something that's intensely local. And that's something that you don't really get to see because I was like, that was the thing about Michinoku Pro. Is it was a Northeast Japan promotion. Osaka Pro was based in Osaka. And I feel like that this kind of captures that energy, like not just in a stylistic standpoint, but also like in an overall just like promotional theme, if that makes sense. Uh, it sounds insane to say about a wrestling match, but there was almost this familial vibe in the crowd. Like, it felt like you were in on something very intimate and kind of special watching Yamato versus Garukin Mask. And going forward, if you're, you know, if you need to add another promotion to your plate to watch this, Ryuku Dragon stuff, at this point, I, I they're running pretty much once a month, and there's always Dragon Gate talent on those shows at this point. And in March, you had Garukin Mask versus Hubbo, which I have not seen, but I am going to to certainly make time to watch that. Uh, J-Stage was really fun until Joji Otani got outed as a sex pest. A very good yeah. prospect who I really enjoyed watching, and man, that sucked on a number of levels to find that out. <laughs> it's just something that, like, this is the thing that I think, like, what when we see how not to have a tea break here case but i think we will see coming out of covid which for japan i think it's going to be we're talking about 2022 in all honesty i think like the smaller promotions like kyushu dragon and like riku kyushu dragon riku dragon and kyushu pro i think like these promotions are going to be in a lot kind of more sustainable state than some of like like war j stage was just because of like they're so like region specific well, they're running outside of Tokyo, which is just a positive to see new venues and, and crowds that can be a little bit more lively, especially at this stage in the game. And it's just ni- it's nice to have something different because I, I've really enjoyed the Kyushu Pro matches that we've gotten on tape with Genki and Susumu defending their tag belts. And, and this is a similar vibe. This is just something different that isn't in first ring or in a, a half full cork and hall. So I like this. I'm thrilled at the partnerships that Dragon has been able to form. We've talked about this numerous times uh, between these regional partnerships, between the Amazon show that Dragon has going right now and between their just other worldly merch game. Nobody is able to generate cash quite like Dragon in Japan right now. Hey, I, I mean, the, they're having a special box for Masato Yoshino's retirement that I almost pulled the trigger on buying. It was like special edition. And I was like, you know what? I thought about it. And then, and then I looked over at Pudge and I was like, you know what? I, I could, I, as much as I really want this, like I, I, I have a child to look after. <laughs> like I, I, I can't be making these reckless decisions as I, as I was once want to do. You know, I, I can't just go buy 30 different new tracksuits now. Man, I uh, saw the number. For my tax return today, we might we might be making a Tokudon purchase again. I uh, was pretty happy with the number that popped out at the end there. Hey, it, it, the, the one thing that there are there's one thing, and there's two of these things in this one thing that I don't. <laughs> money is not. I, I as soon as I started saying this, like Spears, what are you doing? This okay, is a, I'm two, so excited for this. There's two of these things in one thing. Hit me with it. There's. Two masks, so masks are, like, the one thing that I'll just be dumb about. And there's two masks that I would just, like, throw my wallet at, like, the dumb internet meme. Uh, if if they had a Ultimo mask and if they had a Dragon Kid mask. On uh, Toto... Well, I, well, the Dragon Kid website is selling Ultimo masks. Yeah, but, like, we'll, we'll, we know the deal with those masks, right? I, but I think these are the more authentic ones because I, okay. as someone that have seen Ultimo, I've seen Ultimo Dragon wrestle in person. Uh, it was my sophomore year of college. I was sitting in my school's library one Saturday afternoon, just doing some homework, killing time. I get a Slack message from Rich Kreich that afternoon. He says, "Hey, Ultimo's in LaSalle, Illinois, which is about, you know, an over an hour outside of Chicago, and LaSalle, Illinois is just a, a bumfuck town if there ever was one, but AAW had booked him, and they're like, well, Ultimo's in town, do you kind of want to go to that? And I was like, you know, I kind of want to go to that, so I met Rich, we went to the AAW show, and I watched Ultimo Dragon 
hawk merch like you would not believe he did a, a yeah buddy an intermission in ring photo shoot where he rolled in right as people started taking photos smile for the camera click smile for the camera click smile for the camera click intermission's over ultimo rolls out of the ring goes right back to the merch table and then this dude worked the main event and this is I- i'm so happy that i saw this match in person it was Michael Elgin and Ray Phoenix against Sammy Callahan and Ultimo Dragon. Ultimo teased an Asai Moonsault, which was such a great spot. This was before he was doing it in Dragon Gate too, so I was I was extra excited. Uh, took a few flat back bumps. I think you could count them on one hand, but the man did bump a little bit. And then after the match, rolls out of the ring and walks right back to the merch table and starts gladly selling people masks once again. And people are doing the the Futurama shut up and take my money gif at Ultimo and these cheap little masks he was selling. I regret not buying one. I regret not talking his ear off about Toriumon X because uh, I was pretty standoffish because you got to remember at the time this was 2017. Ultimo in our minds as Dragon Gate fans, Mike, Ultimo Dragon was the enemy. And it turns out we were wrong. All along, we were wrong. But yeah, I'm looking at these masks. So the only ones they still have are the light blue ones. And it is what they would call like a pro authentic, I guess, because it's not actually a worn mask, but it is basically made like with like the same fabric and not when the cheap masks. But 19,800 19, yen for that plus shipping. Uh, I might need to call my accountant. You know. If we still had these Manscaped codes, we could really hawk the Manscaped goods, and you guys could pay for Mike Spears and his pro wrestling merchandise addiction. But Manscaped's not paying us right now. Uh, perhaps they will be a month from now, but but right now, they're sitting on the sidelines, so we're going to have to wait for that. Yeah, but what we're not going to be sitting on the sidelines for is for this uh, Yoshino Retrospective uh, series. I tried to think of, of a good name for this thing, like... And nothing's really like kind of coming to mind for it, so the, we're just gonna call this like a Masato Yoshino retrospective. Should we series. just call it Speed Star, a Yoshino retrospective series? Yeah, let's just call it Speed Star. Works a, for me. Masa, a Masato Yoshino retrospective series, and as Case kind of said at the top, we have a bank of matches that we are going to try to revisit between now and August first. It's as Case said, we're not. This is not going to be a weekly thing, at least at this point. We're going to try to get. A bunch of guests to kind of pick their matches and talk about it we've already reached out to some people we have some some folks that are going to come and we're going to talk about these matches but for the first time for the for episode one or episode zero however you want to call it we we both decided to pick one match to talk about and just like one match we feel like embodied masato yoshino in a lot of ways and it was kind of interesting like uh, we were both very cagey i felt like that we didn't want to pick the same match and of course we didn't and just like the two matches we're going to be talking about, uh, Case's selection was uh, Masato Yoshino versus T Hawk for the Open the Dream Gate at Kobe World 2015 from July 20th, 2015. And mine was the uh, Open the Dream Gate match at Kobe World 2018 versus Shingo Takagi from July 22nd, 2018. When watching these two matches, Case, just like overall, kind of felt like we kind of picked two matches that worked well in concert with each other. Yeah, it was. A harder decision for me than I thought it would be because I, I kind of wanted to pick what I thought was a personal favorite Masato Yoshino match. And for as great as his career has been, for as long as his career has been, I struggled coming up with the one match that would define his career because I think you could point to the Ring of Honor Blood Generation versus Do Fix or Six Man, but that's a six man tag and it's as much a Dragon Kid match as a Masato Yoshino match. There's, you know, Mochizuki versus Yoshino from 2014, but that's really the story of Mochizuki more so than it is the story of Yoshino. I thought about the Dragon Kid and Shingo versus Speed Muscle match from the third Dragon Gate USA show, but we just spent a year talking about Dragon Gate USA, and I'm good for a while. I don't need to revisit that archive. So I started thinking about Yoshino performances that I really enjoyed. I went back to some spreadsheets, looked at Masato Yoshino matches that just from a greatness perspective I really enjoyed. And this T-Hawk match, for whatever reason, really left an impression on me at the time. 
it was a match that I know I have not revisited since. So it's been about six years since I've watched this match. And I was really delighted with the way that it held up. Yeah, like that was the thing. Like I did not have my notebooks back then because I wasn't doing Dragon Gate coverage this time. But this match really held up. It really was an artifact of the time. And it just was a match that very much impresses the how over and how important uh, Masato Yoshino is to Dragon Gate because he is he was the most popular man on earth in this match. It's very much a match that represents this time period, and that's kind of the angle that I want to take as we talk about Yoshino versus T-Hawk, is realizing that in a way, this is the end of an era, and as soon as this match concludes, Dragon Gate starts to look drastically different, and really we start to see the formation of the era that we're in now coming out of the result of this match. But before we talk about the match, we have to know how we got here, which the story is pretty simple. Uh, King of Gate 2015, T-Hawk in the semifinals beat then Dream Gate champion BB Hulk. And then in the finals of the tournament, Masao Yoshino beat T-Hawk. Yoshino would then parlay that King of Gate win into defeating BB Hulk for the Dream Gate title. And, Yo- and T-Hawk wanted a rematch and thus it was set for Kobe World 2015. Uh, this was right around the time that I started covering Dragon Gate for VoicesOfWrestling.com. I started with the July 2nd Cork and Hall show in 2015, and then reviewed Kobe World. I've said this story before, I-, I had stayed awake for about 23 hours by the time that World 2015 was all said and done. I had traveled across state lines during the day, stayed up all night and watched the show, and wrote a review that I very much do not like because the Voices of Wrestling mentality at the time, because live Japanese wrestling was still a newer thing, was let's be first to market. Let's write these reviews live. Let's watch all these shows as they happen, and let's publish these shows as soon as the final bell rings, which means that I did not write a great review, and reading it back, I I certainly uh, am not stoked on the product that I turned in. But I will say for me, in the summer of 2015, I was very much into everything that was happening. The rumor at the time was that we were going to get some sort of generational warfare angle because that July Cork and Hall show had the big six in a six-man tag as well as uh, Ricochet and Seidel teaming with Shima against some of the newer guys on the roster. I think it was T-Hawk, Eita, and Shimizu uh, was that six-man. Or maybe it was other guys. I don't remember. But I know for me, I look back at 2015 as one of the best years in Dragon Gate history. Mike, how were you feeling about the product at the time? I was uh, relatively high. This was a interesting time period. I think that with uh, the unit landscape at the time, you had Monster Express kind of careening towards its end. You had millennials who, you know, I mean, were kind of in this place of uh, existence. And you, you came into Kobe World, and it was t and big day to perform. Because you had T-Hawk in the main event, and then Ata had a great Brave Gate match against the champion Akira Tozawa. So it kind of was like a two-match series of Monster Express versus uh, uh, the Millennials there. But it was a very interesting time of the promotion. It just seemed like that a lot of things had happened at that time. Millennials got the refresh with Katoka and El Lindemann going into it. Uh, you also... I'm trying to think my my time frames here in 2015. Uh, Dead or Alive Cage match, that was the one that Shima lost and guys teeth knocked out of right yes that is the the infamous shima screenshot where this man suddenly has no hair and no teeth yeah but and, and, the, and the big thing coming out of it was that uh t-hawk eliminated shima and shima said t-hawk uh you you, you beat me but you're still underachieving it is time for you to really become the star we all thought you were which you know i mean that has a lot of baggage in that phrase looking back in 2021 and in and, and that in and that kind of context and kind of was like because uh the the veteran army disbanded because the millennials said there was a three-way really kind of was a four-way war going on with like because you had the veterans you had matt blanky you had millennials at the jimmies and they were all kind of intermingling at that time the only unit that was free and clear was Monster Express, so like there was a lot of kind of shakeups happening, and it did kind of feel like that a lot of the units would end because we'd be going towards that generational war. Then instead, we had probably one of the stronger heel runs out of anyone in the promotion's history coming out of all of this. So 
it was almost like they were clearing the decks at this time. And this was in the midst of the deck clearing. Very much so. This feels like... Well, I guess we could talk about it with the match, because it's Yoshino versus T-Hawk at this point. Uh, they had had a Dreamgate match in Cork and Hall in November of 2013. I had just rewatched that match and was kind of blown away at just how good Yoshino was in that match compared to T-Hawk, who was there, and perhaps that is a reoccurring theme in this match as well. And then they had, like I said, the aforementioned King of Gate Finals match this year. So this was a, a big match. Yoshino clearly had the edge on T-Hawk going in. I remember at the time, we, we were just removed from the Wrestle Kingdom where it was Tanahashi versus Okada, and everybody assumed that Okada was going to beat Tanahashi and start this new era of New Japan. And it said Tanahashi won, and there's that great shot at the end of that show of Okada walking away from the ring in tears, just crying. He can't believe he lost this match. So the consensus among at least my bubble of Dragon Gate fans at the time was that... Uh, we we thought, we assumed pro wrestling logic was that T-Hawk was going to win this match, but we right. also just didn't necessarily expect, uh, we were, I, I should say this, we were gun shy about it because we had just seen what had happened in New Japan and we had learned that it wasn't necessarily the most obvious thing for the young guy to defeat the established veteran in such a blanket way because we learned from New Japan that that was you know not always the case. So you come into this match with Yoshino as the champion, T-Hawk as the challenger, and they have a very long match. This, even for Kobe World Standards, is really drawn out. Uh, it's one of those matches that starts slow and then has a very, very clear build up until the finish, finishing at just over a half hour. And I should note, if I haven't already, uh, this match is on Drangi Network. So go watch Kobe World 2015. It's a very good show. And this match is in full with the full presentation and Mike, I'd kind of like to know your thoughts on this before I before I break down a few spots. So it's interesting because this was kind of seen as kind of like the first proof that, uh, or the second proof really, that T-Hawk was not the person that some people in the promotion thought he was because that first title match against Masato Yoshino, it basically was Masato Yoshino while wrestling a husk of someone because millennials weren't that over and they try to give him some juice here, and they try to have like the Shima like clap him on the back and say, "This is your time here." But they came together and they had a really a strong match. But this is very much like Yoshino kind of running circles around T Hawk. T Hawk's solid in it, especially in the finishing stretch. He really kind of comes alive. But the opening ten minutes was basically Yoshino eating his lunch, and we got to see the thing that I'm going to really enjoy in the series is seeing like the callbacks and the moves that, you know, Masao Yoshino can't perform right now. Like seeing like the leg trap tarantula, the Kolomori that uh, La Estrella now is gifted, has not done it yet. And then feeding that right into his sprinting. Uh, I know he doesn't have a name for it, but it's Roman Reigns drive-by kick that he would do. Yeah. Where it's like, <laughs> yeah, in doing like that. And he ran about across the arena and hit it. And it just was wild. Uh, Mike Seidel, Monster Express assistant. Nice to see. Nice to see. It took and me, then, and this match was a half hour long. It took me about 28 minutes to figure out who Mike Seidel was because I forgot that he was over on this tour. Well, I knew Matt was, but Matt was just mm -hmm. in the prior match, so he wasn't at ringside. But there was a blonde haired kid at the Monster Express corner, and it was driving me insane. I did not know who it was <laughs> until, again, right before the finish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's something where, like, I remember when, when there used to be assistance in the units. That was really kind of cool. And it, it's something where, like, T-Hawk, like, it, when he had his hope spot, and his hope spot originally was doing his huge corner chop and then doing a insanely nuts deep squat in a suplex position of Masato Yoshino into the brain buster. And it's the, the, the thing that, like, other than, like, I don't want to hammer home this point that T-Hawk was not over because he had his own fans there, but... T Hawk like did like this insane smell sell oversell of this uh the avalanche uh sling blade leading into the finishing stretch that just was like one of the ones that actually it was Yagi as referee. He actually like went and was like shaking his hand in front of his face to make sure that he was like with it there. And then the finishing stretch and with like the Ude Yushino into the Sol Naciente into a into the first into Sol Naciente into uh T Hawk's brain buster and then We've talked about this with Alan. I think that Masato Yoshino, sorry, Jeff Jarrett, has the all-time greatest kickouts at 2.99. 
and boy, did he have one of those in the second night ride before the finish. Yeah, so like I said, it's a really slow start to the match. And then I think the turning point, when things really start to heat up and it really starts to feel like a Dragon Gate-level main event, is they start to have this chop battle, and that is obviously something that T-Hawk excelled at. It's something that Yoshino does very well. And once they they pass the chop battle, which I feel like is probably 20 minutes into the match, now that's that sounds like it's a long period of time before things really get going, but I really think that is just the, the final period before this match shifts into the next gear. Uh, T-Hawk gets a night ride, Yoshino kicks out. Uh, Yoshino has that, what I, I don't know if he has a, a specific name for this, but I always call it the baseball lariat, where... Yoshino basically looks like a center fielder who comes up and throws, and he just throws the meanest clothesline at guys. In well, he... Case, uh, that is a baseball lariat. He calls it that. Huge win for Case, someone that also doesn't know the name of moves often, but he hits the baseball lariat, and T-Hawk pops up from it, which is really the only time that I remember somebody doing that, because that is kind of his last stand move before he goes into... Uh, whatever crazy finishing move that he's about to do, that is always kind of the one A to the one B that is the finish. T Hawk popped up from that. He hit a second night ride, and that is the just the giant Yoshino kick out that Mike mentions. Uh, Yoshino hits one Torbellino. He hits two Torbellinos on the second one. T Hawk pops up, and then Yoshino is able to hit another. So he hits three Torbellinos, and then shortly after that, puts T Hawk in the Soul Naciente Kai for the win. I, in my review in 2015, gave this match four and three quarter stars. In 2021, in May of this blessed year, I am still giving this four and three quarter stars. I went four and a half. I thought that this was one of my favorite T Hawk matches. I remember, like, when you picked this one, I was like, oh, yeah, this was a really solid one. Like, Masato Yoshino and T Hawk have great chemistry. Like, I don't think we will revisit the 2017 Kobe World Main Event. <laughs> no, no, we will not. I read my, I reread my review of that earlier today, actually, because it, it's tying into a point I want to make in just a second. We're good. We don't need to watch the Kobe World 2017 Main Event. Yeah, this one's better than that. But, uh, I, it, it's something that, like, it has a lot of, like, you know, this is a great match for us to start off with because there's a lot of just like textbook like peak Masato Yoshino here. It's just like it has almost all the hits. It, unless we're going back and, and seeing sexy Tarzan or watching some speed muscle matches, if you want to watch like a big Masato Yoshino singles match, this is one of the ones you go for. Yeah, this is a really definitive Yoshino performance for me. And one of my big takeaways, although this is the Masato Yoshino series, and I primarily want to focus the discussion on him, I do think it's worth talking about his opponent, because while T-Hawk was in Drangate, especially Millennials era T-Hawk, I was a massive supporter of him, thought he was someone that could win the Dreamgate belt at some point, thought he could be a credible main eventer, and was a little confused and almost shocked when I would see pushback on like, hey, maybe this isn't the guy. Like, maybe we have some concerns here because I really thought at the time <laughs> that T-Hawk was, was such a great wrestler. Mike, what were you going to say? I, I was going to say you weren't talking to me at that time. No, I was not, clearly, because I, I really had a lot of faith in T-Hawk and I thought he was a great wrestler. And then I went back and I watched this match and I was like, yeah, I understand what the concerns are. Like, this is still a great match. It is a great italics, all caps, bold, and underlined great match. But it is the Masato Yoshida uh, show. T-Hawk really adds almost nothing to this match. And I say that before I say this next sentence, which is going to be an insane transition. But Mike, given what immediately follows this, which is the dissolution of Shingo and Monster Express, the end of Mad Blanky, the rise of Berserk, and everything that happens with T-Hawk going forward. Is this match the peak of T-Hawk's career? I mean, no slams against Russell 1. This is the biggest match of his career. Very much so. Because, you know, the Russell 1 stuff, I, I think he headlined Oda Ward City Gymnasium once, maybe a, a big Yokohama show, but... You know, it was Wrestle One. They, I mean, Strong yeah. Hearts was the only thing that ever drew in Wrestle One, but it was still Wrestle One. Yeah, and it's something that, like, I'm pulling up the attendance from the show. This is going to be a work number because Dragon Gate only stopped working their numbers when they chained 
when they changed to ownership, the announced sentence was 9650, which probably I would say 6500 is probably an accurate estimate, I would say, but it's very much so like when you like look at that like just look at his other Kobe World main event, which I keep on saying 9650. Okay, his second Kobe World main event was Yamato versus T-Hawk 9800, which I don't buy, but anyways, uh this is kind of but that match very much was like uh, T Hawk on the Champions Road, right? Because he won King of Gate that year, and that match was just kind of there. Well, so yeah. So the the reason I ask about T Hawk's peak is so just his trajectory specifically. Uh, after this, he gets thrown into a deal where he's it, Shingo was on the outs with Monster Express, but they haven't broken up just yet. Uh, the Millennials end on August sixth. So the Cork and Hall right after the show, they they lose a unit to Spans match. So T Hawk is without a unit. And he starts teaming with Shingo, who is increasingly becoming a bigger and bigger heel. Uh, But Shingo hates T-Hawk, and he doesn't want anything to do with him. He turns on him in all of their matches. And then you see the the formation of Verzer come out of that, which is initially targeted partially at making sure that T-Hawk doesn't become a main eventer. So what you get is an entire year of T-Hawk and Monster Express where... Uh, he challenges for the Twin Gate belts at one point. He has a very successful Triangle Gate run. And from a kayfabe sense and from a match quality sense, like, yeah, T-Hawk is doing all right. But the feel at the time is that Monster Express doesn't really, he, he doesn't fit in with this group. He's not the replacement uh, of a Shingo type. He's just uh, this other new role that doesn't really blend with Tozawa's charisma or Yoshino's charisma. And then, or Shachi's charisma. Of course, or Shachi Hoko Boy's charisma. And then after a year, he turns on them, and you start to see the tail end of Berserk, the formation of Antios, and then, you know, he is obviously gone by the time they are R.E.D. But this is really it, because, you know, his path to the championship was in 2017, which is the year that he wins King of Gate, but the feeling that year was like, oh boy, here they go with T-Hawk, like, this is going to be the year that he does it. He was, at least to me, a noticeably cooler prospect in 2017 than he was in 2015, whereas had he won this match, it would have been very early for him in, in his career. I don't think he would have done well. I don't think he would have been able to take him the ball and run with it, but he felt like a prospect. Like, he felt like someone, at least to me, that could be something, whereas 2017, it was a, a bit of a force down the throats of the fans of Dragon Gate. Yeah, so two quick things following up on you. If you on what you said, if you look at the poster for Kobe World Pro Wrestling Festival 2017 case, j- j- just like g- go to one of the wikis that has it and just take a look at T Hawk for me. I- I'll give you a second to look at that. How much of a dead factor was he in 2017? Well, there's an article on VoicesWrestling.com where I talk about all the failed ace runs and how I basically say like, well, this is probably going to be it for T Hawk. We will see because he won King of Gate to absolute silence and it went away in Hakata Star Lanes and the crowd doesn't care. The Millennials, this uh, Ada, his tag team partner, was already like on his ascent. Uh, Yamamura, this was the year of his, of Yamamura and he was going against Yama, he was going against Yamato and everyone. My final sense to this thing was was like uh, to conclude this is like all of that leads us to June twenty third, twenty seventeen, the eighteenth Kobe Kenan. World Hall Show of T-Hawk challenging Yamato for the Open the Dream Gate Championship. Maybe this is another stumbling block, a second main event loss to provide him for more motivation character. Make him someone that the crowd can identify with and get behind. He could be like BB Hulk, who took three opportunities to win the big one on the big stage with the crowd finally behind him. Or like many other, T-Hawk become another failed ace where Dragon Gate fans count down the, the days until someone takes the throne away from him. They didn't even give him the title, and it was already that predestined that this wasn't going to work out at least in my opinion, in 2017. No, it was bleak. I mean, I'm looking at the the King of Gate 2017 results right now, and I I obviously watched these shows, but they went back-to-back nights in Hakata, where in the semis, T-Hawk beat Ata in their only singles match, and then T-Hawk beat Doi to win King of Gate, and I don't remember a thing about those matches. I have no recollection of them whatsoever, and this was supposed to be T-Hawk's destiny. You know, this is what it was all leading up to. And you can even point to two years later with Ben K, where I'm personally satisfied with Ben's Dreamgate run. I think I got enough out of that as a fan to say that this lived up to my expectations. 
other people feel differently, but at the very least, you can say that his run through King of Gate, the undefeated stretch en route to beating Pocket World, was very memorable. And there's a reason that on this podcast and on this website, VoicesWrestling.com, we spent so much time detailing Ben K's ascent to the top because it felt like a big deal. Whereas with T Hawk mm-hmm. in 2017, like you said, he hadn't even won the belt and it already felt like a failure. And that is that is such a good point. That is such an indictment on T Hawk, who, you know, luckily got out. And I enjoyed all of his Wrestle One work. I thought he was an excellent Wrestle One champion. But it's crazy to think in in his career that his peak, his biggest stage, and his biggest moment, and his best match on a big stage was this match with Masato Yoshino, where Yoshino worked circles around him. You can see why Yoshino is who he is. Because he was absolutely incredible in this match. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Case, check the uh, the Skype message log. I sent you the photo of T-Hawk on this poster. <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe the expression on his face? Uh, man, it's, it's something. Uh, it looks like a guy that's not ready to lead the second biggest promotion in Japan into battle. Uh, it's also worth noting on that, uh, on that poster, again, Yamada was front and center. You see... Hulk, Shingo, Doi, and Yoshino behind him, and then kind of off to the side is T-Hawk. He is so clearly not the guy for this job. He is so clearly not a main eventer by 2017. It's just something that, like, you look at what's happened past then. We talked about, like, Russell 1, but there was, like, a time period last year, like, right as COVID hit, that there was big conversations that T-Hawk was going to leave wrestling, and everyone's kind of response was, you know what? That makes sense. That makes sense a, a lot. So, so I mean, you like look at him, and and maybe it is a right place, right time guy, but it never really seemed that way with uh with him. And I don't think that's ever, I don't think that, that he'll ever really have that opportunity. You know, I I think that that this was a shot, like you were saying. Yeah, I mean, you know, I still think he's talented enough. If he went to, I think all Japan would be the best environment for him. If he went to all Japan, and even you know, was just T-Hawk. He wasn't Stronghearts T-Hawk. He wasn't Gleet T-Hawk. If he just cut all ties and said, I'm going to do this by myself, I think he would be a success in all Japan. I think that style would work towards his favor. I think the crowd would get into him. But over time, it just, Draggy became less and less of a friendly environment towards him, which is a bummer because I, you know, I really think this is a changing of the guard. You can look at when the Millennials landed in Japan, August 30th, 2013, to this match, it is, th- that that is an era of this promotion. That is the Millennials era, because Tiok and Ata are such a tremendous tag team. You see the rise of Flamita, you see Yosuke Santa Maria, and UT and Kotoka and Al Lindemann, they all sort of find their place on the roster. And like I said, a few weeks after this, the Millennials die, and T-Hawk never finds his footing again. Yeah, yeah, and it's very interesting that this was your match, and then I picked another match that was very much a kind of a changing of a guard moment in the Kobe World 2018 main event. This was Shingo Takagi versus Masato Yoshino. Masato Yoshino recently won the title against Masaki Mochizuki in a very rough match. This was the year that Masato Yoshino won King of Gate with the uh, Speed Star Crucifix, and that kind of became a big thing. And the lead up to this match was really interesting in the greater context of where Dragon Gate was in the summer of 2018. Yeah, in contrast to 2015, where I was really under the promotion, I really liked the direction that everything was going. I think the summer of 2018 is probably the year that I've cared the least about Dragon Gate since I started following it, and really wrestling as a whole. Outside of New Japan main events, which that year was a lot of uh, Okada Omega stuff, and it was a really good G1 that year, and I remember being really into that, but this wasn't a year that I cared about Noah. This wasn't a year that I cared about All Japan. This wasn't a year that I cared about Big Japan. I was out on DDT at this point, and I was out on Dragon Gate for the most part at this point. My favorite thing in wrestling at the time was actually Strong Hearts invading Wrestle 1, because that had happened in June of this year, and... To me, that was the most exciting thing in wrestling because that was something new and it was something exciting. And although it seems crazy in hindsight now, there was a real thought in the summer of 2018 that Shima, T-Hawk, Lindemann, and Yamamura had made the right move by jumping off 
of the Dragon Gate ship and that they were going to have more success as this renegade foursome than they would uh, constructed at the confines of the Dragon Gate promotion. So I was not feeling this product at the time. It felt like a, a promotion that was directionless. I was really struggling to even just do monthly reviews at this point because we weren't obviously doing the show weekly, but I was still doing my monthly Cork and Hall reviews and even that was just kind of a pain at sometimes. Like I just didn't want to sit down and write about these shows. And I remember we recorded an episode after Kobe World 2018 where I said this is the first time since I started following the promotion where Kobe World wasn't an event for me. I didn't stay up and watch it live. I didn't have any sort of celebration about it. It was a show that I woke up and I watched the next day and then I, w- I wrote my review and then I went on with my life. And I, I reread that review earlier today. And the point that I I emphasized throughout the entire review was this is a promotion that at one time I knew and now I don't. I have no idea where anything is going to go. I have no idea what's next. And quite honestly, I just don't care that much. And the there was a good reason for that because we've talked about on the show just like how things were in 2018. Just to lay out a timeline of 2018 in February, there was the first OWE event that had a whole lot of Dragon Gate participation there. But starting before that, that was something that started at Kobe World 2017, where basically Dragon Gate formed an agreement with this company that became OWE, which was going to take the Shaolin Kung Fu uh, athletes and create a wrestling promotion that was going to be exclusively catered to Chinese audiences. Dragon Gate would help train these wrestlers as they thought that the Dragon Gate style would be a compliment there. It was Shima and several others who were going back and forth between Japan and Shanghai for the for the main year of 2017. And then they did this show. And then Memorial Gate 2018 was the last time that Shima was the second to last time that Shima appeared on a show. Then there was a whole lot of buzz of what's going on there, what's going on there. I've talked a lot before about when I discovered what was going on there and ran up to Joe Lanes. I may have been under the influence when I did so, but I was still doing journalism case. I was still doing the work. And the remainder of 2018 was really weird because on the uh, the uh, Kyoto KBS Hall TV taping, Shingo, uh, Shima made his first appearance in about two months, and he brought two of the students, Gao Jingja and Scorpio X Double, to have an out of context match with him and T Hawk because T Hawk was a member of Antios at this time. And it was kind of like, what is going on here? Shima was was still a member of Over Generation, and it was a and that was the the show right before. Uh, Dead or Alive 2018, T-Hawk and Ada were Twin Gate champions as Antios. They dropped the belts to Big Ben where in a match where it's clear why Ada was completely disinterested in this match because the next day it was announced that OW would form and that was the second split of the Dragon System. Or really kind of the third split, but it's the second major one. And what also happened at Dead or Alive other than this split was that Shingo Takagi was the survivor in the cage match. He shaved Ryo Saito's head he vacated slash retired the awari gate title and he took over antios back again and then when all the news came out about the new company he was very angry that there are wrestlers being named to the board of directors the ones that were named that their public name or the, that people knew who they were publicly were masada yoshino super shisa and anthony w mori takagi was incredibly furious that he was left off the card and he decided that he was going to challenge uh Masato Yoshino, who was the champion at that time, to win the title, declare himself champion, and install changes. And he basically, he did this whole entire angle on Twitter, and it was like the most compelling thing that Dragon Gate did in this promotion for about 18 months was this lead up here of, of Shingo Takagi trying to like burn down the company and reform it into something else, whereas Masato Yoshino obviously represented the establishment. He was a member of the board of directors, and he was the champion. And it was a really interesting lead up to there. I have a couple of articles on Voices of Wrestling, kind of covering this time period, and then also covering when Shingo announces he announced his departure from Dragon Gate in September sixth of twenty eighteen. I had completely forgotten about the angle leading up to this match because it kind of again shows where I was. I remember the the first OWE show that happened that was on Twitch and it was all the Dragon Gate guys on the show and Flamita and Bandito and Zach Wentz and Des- Desmond Xavier were on that show and I mean it's one of those things that would happen now. I I would be all over it and I I would be on top of it, but in 2018 
just, you know, going through through life stuff and, and still being uh, pretty new to college at that point and trying to figure some stuff out, my interest in wrestling was just down. So I remember, like, when Shima left and split, I... I was more confused than anything, and I didn't, I, you know, we we were certainly friendly, but didn't have the relationship we do now, and I just remember having a lot of unanswered questions, and just being down on the product, and not really caring, and in this Kobe World main event, despite the fact that it's Shingo and Yoshino, who are guys that always deliver, this was not a show I was particularly looking forward to, after a year of a bunch of stuff, where I would just kind of log on to Twitter, and read something about Dragon Gate, and go, huh, Okay, not sure what to do with that information. It was just a, an, an entire year of that, and it had been leading up to this. Uh, Kobe World 2018, I think, as a show, is one of the weaker Kobe World shows they've ever had. We actually talked about this on the the podcast we just did with Alan Forel, where, you know, on this show, third from the top, it's Hiro Saito, Mochizuki, and Tatsumi Fujinami against Don Fuji, Yoshiaki Fujiwara, and Punch Tamanaga. That is third from the top on this show. Like, there was just nothing really for me to sink my teeth into outside of that Natural Vibes versus uh, Yoshida, Kanda, and Masato Tanaka match, which ended up being great. But this was a really strange show, and I think this was a a, a pretty strange main event. I, I would like to hear your thoughts on this match. So the reason why I felt like this is kind of reflective was that the first part of the match was all Yoshino. And in retrospect, it's pretty clear, like, yeah, Yoshino, because this was going to be his last singles match against Doi. Brother, the speed star is going to look strong in this. But I really kind of enjoyed, like, the fact that, like, they went for signature offense immediately. He hit a Torbellino within, like, the first two minutes. And then also you had a quick uh, made in Japan that just was, like, popped out of. And then you had this uh, very much, like, front and center, like, Masao Yoshino was in control, which made Shingo Takagi's offense when he came back onto attack really awesome because he was, like, powering up, and we all know how great of a power wrestler he was. And then you had the nice wrinkle of Shingo as a heel just, like, being obsessed with, like, plunder and, like, putting him through a table and then having part of the broken table that Yoshida handed him and being able to cut off a Masato Yoshino tote by hitting him square in the head with the uh, baseball swinging him with the broken table. And I thought that like, there's like the natural chemistry and charisma there between the two of them that really kind of played off of it. And then with the teaser there, and then, I mean, they were really laying it into each other given like these two guys career, like this might be the stiffest match between these two. You know, these guys have had obviously legendary careers. Uh, we spoke at length on podcast with Alan and just on this show about how great we think Shingo is, how great we think Yoshino is. These two wrestled four times in singles matches throughout their career. We have three of them on tape, Dangerous Gate 2015, King of Gate 2018, and then this match. I don't know if they ever had a great singles match. I, I don't think these two work super well together. Now, I, I enjoyed the stiffness, and that's something that, you know, God, at this point, I can't imagine Yoshino taking any of this offense. I just, this match wouldn't be possible, and this was already after his first major neck injury, so the fact that he was taking this offense as well as he did was very impressive to me. But, I, yeah, I I did not in the moment think this was a great match, and on rewatch, I thought maybe just being more into the promotion, uh, honestly being more emotionally invested now than I was in 2018, I thought maybe this would improve on rewatch. I think it's a very good match. I, there was one spot in particular towards the finishing stretch that I really liked. Uh, Shingo hits a German suplex. Yoshino lands on his stomach. He pops up, hits the Torbellino. Shingo pops up, hits a Lariat. Yoshino pops up, hits a Lightning Spiral. That sort of back-to-back-to-back-to-back move sequence was incredible to me, but... I I do not feel like this is necessarily a match that, that I would put on my Masato Yoshino greatest hits. If we're doing a two-match compilation of Yoshino DVDs or, or of his career, uh, 10 matches on disc one, 10, ma- 10 matches on disc two, I don't think this is making the cut. That's, well, let's track that as we're going along, you know, yeah. make, up, make up our mixtape here. So definitely, uh, would you put the T-Hawk match on there as well? Or would you exclude it? I would put the T-Hawk match in my... If, if Let's say we're going to do the essential 20 Masato Yoshino matches. That is making the list. This Shingo match, or any of the Shingo matches, I, I don't think they are. I I was much higher than you on this. I 
it it was something maybe with like I thought like that Shingo and I thought Shingo always has a level of brutality when he was in Berserk and Antios that we got to see like the the sliding D to the side of the head was very gruesome to me like I was like I I was sitting I was sitting here watching it and I winced when I saw it and I was like oh I forgot about that that's nuts but I just but like do these two guys have great chemistry together I I think they do but I can see how they come off as not. But I, I've always I just... wanted more from their matches. I remember feeling that way about the Dangerous Gate match as well, because the, you know Dangerous Gate is such a terrific show. Uh, that's the the Mad Blankies versus Jimmy's unit disbands match on that show. There was a really good Twin Gate defense there, and then you know the main event obviously led into Shingo's Dream Gate title run, which is maybe the best thing Dragon Gate has ever done. And still, by the end of it, I was just like, ah, that Yoshino match was just okay. That was kind of the weakest thing that he did in that in that entire run. I don't know. I, I, I felt like that was like really kind of interesting to like use the plunder in the way they did. And this might be the last lightning spiral that I remember Yoshino hitting. Hmm. That, that is something I had not thought about, but I, I certainly can't remember a more recent one off the top of my head. Now, I will say that the way they used the plunder, I, I, I did like in this match a, a big spot through the table early. And then uh, I think you said this earlier, but Shingo hitting Yoshino in the head with the broken table as he was going for the Tope Suicida was a very nice spot. I, I just, I could save the uh, the ramble on this and say I went three and three quarters on this match, which is what I gave in my original review as well. I need to find the notebook I had at that time for 2018, but I went four and a quarter on this. Yeah, you're much higher on this than I am. I, I think this is a very interesting match. It's the last big thing that Shingo did, unless you really want to count his finale against BB Hulk. It's the last thing of consequence he did in Dragon Gate. And uh, it's one of those that I, I wouldn't necessarily remember from either man's career. It, it didn't make my insanely detailed and long list of great Shingo matches <laughs> in his career. And, and like I said, I, I think it's a very interesting match given the time period, but... It's one of those that I almost look back more from a trivial perspective, like, oh, yeah, this is where Drangate was at this time. Ugh. I'm glad things have gotten better, more so than I think this is a great match. That's fair. I, I don't think this would make my 20 list either, to be fair. Which says a lot about I, just how good Yoshino was. Yeah, yeah, I mean, four and a quarter. Like, other, there's wrestlers throughout history that wish they would have a four and a quarter star match. But I just, you know, this was just something that, like, maybe it is, like, I felt like this match told the story of that time. I feel like that was very compelling to me, but I totally understand how, like, with this time period and, like, your lived experience at that time period, it's somewhat of a turnoff. Thank you for understanding, Mike. That's really nice of you. Hey, that that's what we do here. That That's what we do here. But I think that is going to be it for this part of the Speed Star Masato Yoshino retrospective. Did I get that name right? Uh, I, yeah, speed, well, let's, let's go uh, Speed Star, the Masato Yoshino Career Retrospective Podcast, something like that. There, there we go, Speed Star, the Masato Yoshino Career Retrospective Podcast, but I think that's going to be it for us, Case, unless you had anything else you want to add on before we got out of here. Uh, just that, uh, as of the day we're recording this, May 11th, it is the 24th anniversary of the original Toriyaman class, which was Shima, Magnum Tokyo, Suwa, Don Fuji, and the man later known as Super Shisa reporting to Toriyam, Toriyaman, Mexico. Uh, on the Open the Voice Gate Twitter account, at Open Voice Gate, I tweeted out the link to a very rarely seen match from November of 97 that was those five men plus Dragon Kid, their debut in Arena Mexico. It is the first match of Dragon Kid's career. You can find that, again, at our Twitter account, at Open Voice Gate. Uh, and I, I was re-watching part of the first ever Toriyaman show today, which is on the Dragon Gate Network. And I did not realize that they have footage from the first ever Toriyaman show on that episode that, that is the first of Amados Amigos. Uh, I had always just assumed that show wasn't taped. It was a couple of student matches and then Ultimo versus Negro Casas in the main event. They show all of the matches in clip form, though, so that is literally the earliest footage we have of these guys, and, and I thought that was very interesting, so I would go back and check that out. Yeah, uh, I think that's from Nakapon, the footage there. Yeah, it is at the top of the list of my, my all-time holy grail would be seeing an uncut version of that show. Uh, more than anything, I would like that, but I will take the clip footage for now. And like I said, that's on the Dragon Gate Network. Let us get into the Gaora offices. We could have a field day. Just like 
because like they would have to have the full tape unless someone filmed it in Mexico and sent them just the stuff they wanted to use for it. The footage is is top notch. I mean, it it matches the quality of everything else that we've seen uploaded to the network. So I have to think it's Gaiora footage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So check out that. Uh, As we said, uh, check out the Pro Pro Wrestling Torch, the Pro Wrestling Paradise podcast with friend of the show, Alan Forrell. We did monster recording that'll be released throughout this week and yeah thank you all for listening uh you can follow the podcast and you really should follow the twitter account we've been kind of not just posting results lately i made sure to wish a happy anniversary to don fuji a couple days ago and then you followed up on that with a much better thing to follow up with but it's at open voice gate i'm at fuji Heyo, two eyes like don fuji and case is at underscore in your case so for a case i'm mike thanks for listening to open voice gate we'll catch you next week as we get our first week of King of Gate coverage. Take care.